Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco. Coming up, we're going to take a look at some Daily Carry Co. Uh, kit. Really cool stuff they sent out to me. In Life Knife, Knife Life News, we're going to... Uh, what should you be thinking? All that coming up on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome back to the show. This week I've been posting a lot of new videos uh, about new knives coming through and coming across my desk. But this week, uh, in this week's pocket check, uh, I got some old, tried and true, trusted, faithful um, knives in my pockets. And uh, well, I'm happy to show them to you right here. Make sure that uh, after I finish, you pause the video and uh, type down below. Let me know what you're carrying. That always helps me uh, discover new knives. Uh, I rely on all of you to help me stay informed with what the latest, coolest stuff is. All right, today I'm carrying a a, uh, a modern classic, the Demco 8020 featuring the Shark Lock. This is the MG version. MG means machine ground. That means that blade was uh, profiled on a, a machine, and then the uh, actual cutting edge was put on by hand in a grinder. Uh, this knife ha is the first knife by Demco to feature the shark lock, which is an extremely, extremely strong lock. It's right up there with his triad lock, if you ask him. Now, I haven't done any of the tests, uh, and I believe him. Uh, the triad lock is an amazing lock, uh, lock back lock that constantly, through use, gets even better because uh the notch uh that is provided for the tang to to or the tab to drop into um well look at the video but uh this is kind of right up there because it's got a spring pushing a plunger right up against the uh, tang of the blade so it's always forcing forward and uh and then through the use of the knife it's it just strengthens up the lockup plus it's a great great fidget knife uh if you have if, if that's uh, part of your knife making um, criteria, not knife making, but knife collecting and carrying criteria, how fun it is to use. This one is way up there. This uh, cost me a pretty penny, um, uh, over 400 bucks, if I recall correctly. Uh, so this is an expensive one, but they do make uh, a much more readily available AD 20.5. It is smaller, kind of in almost every dimension it's thinner it's got grivery it's made overseas in taiwan and uh uses aus 10 blade steel and can be had for like 130 bucks i believe uh if you want to scratch that itch and it also comes in this beautiful clip point and they're they're awkward but charming shark's foot which is a sheep's foot blade uh so i highly recommend a, a demco shark's foot or or uh, shark lock knife whether you go all out and find the 80 20 or even get a custom which is really going all out or you uh, find the 80 20.5 at, at a dealer and get that plus the cool thing about the 80 20.5 uh, the more readily available uh, model is that there are scads of people on the secondary market or in the ancillary knife markets, making handles. Uh, we just spoke to someone, uh, Transparent Knives, who does a lot of reblades for the AD 20.5. So it's one of those knives uh, that is really going uh, in the direction of self-customization. So uh, uh, great knife, great lock, and um, uh, we're, we're, we're lucky to have such innovators in our country. All right, next up <clears throat> on my hip, I had uh, the tried and true uh, Voodoo made by Kramer Custom Knives. I've been carrying this one quite a bit, uh, remembering that this is a great spring and summer knife. And where I live here in Virginia, it's gone immediately to uh, summer this weekend. So this one gets a lot of carry. You can see how, um, if you're if you're watching, on the side that touches my, uh, comes closer to my skin, that's uh, this side here, you can see how it's a little bit darker uh, north of where the sheath uh, protects the micarta so you can see how the how my uh, personal 
moisture has gone lovely has gone into that micarta anyway i like how micarta patinas so i wanted to show that off but uh, this is a very thin very slicey hollow ground clip point blade or upswept persian blade um that's what uh, eric kramer calls it i prefer to call it a clip point doesn't matter uh but very very sharp on that primary edge very thin behind the edge on that primary edge and then the swedge i had him sharpen that that comes to a much more oblique tearing splitting um gouging kind of edge uh more than a slicing edge on the primary a great knife for self-defense if you needed it uh, i have it set up to draw in reverse grip like this uh, but also just a great knife this is 154 cm blade steel one of my absolute favorites and uh does a great job in utility kind of just EDC tasks. I've used this, I have used this one for such things. Oftentimes my uh my daily fixed blade carry is kind of strictly tactical and I don't don't ever end up carrying uh pulling it out unless I'm gonna use it for some uh you know just fiddle around with it. But uh this is one of those fixed blade knives that I will pull out and use just for everyday tasks. This and the hog tooth tanto get that a lot. Uh, yeah, Eric Kramer custom knives. Check them out on Instagram. Um, I would say that these are custom fixed blade knives that are definitely worth the investment. They are not, uh, this, this was a little bit more expensive than I've paid recently, um, in fixed blade custom knives, but well, well worth it about the same cost as this knife here. So I was walking around with an expensive loadout today, I, but I guess that's that happens a lot. All right. And lastly, uh, my my usual these days uh, in the left pocket is the uh, Jack Wolf Knives laid back jack. I'll just show you briefly. You've seen a lot of this knife. Uh, I think there might be a few left at dealers, but man, they're going like hotcakes, uh, as is expected. The last one, the Gunstock Jack went quickly, but I think this went even quicker. I think everyone in the world loves a swayback. I do. Uh, I love a swayback. It's probably my uh, overall favorite pattern of uh, of traditional slip joint blade. What he's done here, or a knife, I should say, what he's done here is calm down that upward curve of the handle. There's, it, it's still there. You can still see it, and you can still feel it, but it's uh, it's a lot less pronounced. And I like that because uh, in the normal grip, uh, a uh, normal sort of saber grip, where you have the edge down. And you're just using the tip. It or it keeps the tip oriented in a in a in a place to use it for utility cuts and a you know those kind of pulling cuts in an easier way. You don't have to torque your wrist in any way, but you still get the benefit when you flip it around <clears throat> like this. Swaybacks are 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 great for reversing the blade for a sort of pairing motion, or if you're whittling a sort of carving motion. And having the blade, the edge face you, so you get the both benefits here. Oh, speaking of my carta patina, this one's this one's patina ing nicely. Uh, I I was almost tempted to put oil on it, but I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to see this thing. I'm going to see this thing through, and it's <laughs> it's starting to patina nicely on its own. I'm a big nerd. I know uh, this has in a, integral bolsters and liners of titanium. Integral meaning the the Bolsters are not soldered onto the liners. Uh, so integral has a slightly different meaning for a slip joint knife than it does, say, a modern folding tactical locking blade. Uh, one other great feature on this knife is that full height hollow ground uh, M390 blade. Very thin, very slicey. And then you have this great sharpening notch here, that triangular sharpening notch, which is not only handsome, uh, but will allow you to sharpen all the way up to that top uh, apex of the triangle and still have a thin and slicey edge so just a fantastic knife and man it's been a pleasure carrying this on the daily see before before i started uh with the laid back uh, i mean with the jack wolf knives a couple months back i was not in a slip joint phase uh, slip joints just weren't playing into my daily carry and now they're back which means on the daily on a daily basis i have full representation of my knife um situation here with a with a locking front right pocket knife a fixed blade knife on my right hip and then a slip joint in my front left pocket so i feel the family's all reunited and things are working great again so that's what i was carrying today 
Uh, what were you carrying? Let me know. Are you a fixed blade knife carrier, a daily fixed blade knife carrier? If you are, let me know what that is. Uh, that's always interesting to me, how people solve the fixed blade problem. It took me a long time, but now I have like, I have my preferred carry spot and everything seems to work there nicely. And if I were to actually need a fixed blade knife uh, for a defensive purpose, it's set up for that. And then if I need something a little more robust than whatever pocket knife I'm carrying, I have it on me. And the funny thing is, is that that just does not come up in my daily life. But if it does, I'm ready. Uh, let me know what you were carrying today. Uh, drop a comment down below. Uh, we are going to be doing another Gentleman Junkie Knife giveaway as we do every month on the third Thursday of the month on Thursday Night Knives. I have not decided what that's going to be, um, but it'll be a good one. And uh, um, who knows what else might get thrown in. This last uh, Gentleman Junkie giveaway, we threw something in that was a, a cool little extra uh, that showed up on my door. They sent me two. I kept one and I gave the sent one along. I'm going to show you that in the state of the collection. We'll get to that in a minute. But I want to talk to uh, a, a recent knife that I've gotten and shown off quite a bit that I, I, I absolutely still love. And that's this. This is the Gooseworks um, uh, Resco Instruments. The, the watch company has a little knife su subsidiary called uh, Gooseworks. This is the Gooseworks Mekong Delta Combat Folder. Now, I saw this originally on Naf Sergeant's um, uh, channel, and he uh, had gotten wind of this and thought it was, um, he got a little bit of bad information and uh, thought it was an American-made knife. And I, I saw it, fell in love with it from his uh, initial impressions video and w ran out and bought it like immediately before the video was even over. And it showed up uh, with no pomp and circumstance. It was wrapped in foam paper and taped to the inside of a priority um, U USPS box <laughs> with no card, no receipt, no box or anything. And uh, I loved it. It was like, oh, this is like some dude just made it, pulled it off the mill, wrapped it up and sent it to me. Um, so a, a bit of mystique got built up around this very stout and large um, washer knife that really does feel like the mix of a Chris Reeve, Sabenza, and a Spartan Harzy, um, uh, Spartan Harzy folder. Uh, come to find out a couple of weeks later through Nav Sergeant, who uh, who got some more information that this is actually made by Best Tech, and. Uh, some of the mystique has melted away, I got to say. Now, don't get me wrong. I do love Best Tech, and I do understand the need for an American company to use Best Tech as an OEM, you know, to make the, the knives they want to make and sell. And they never said on their website that this was made in the USA. So I cannot say that it's false advertising or anything like that. Um, cause in a sense, they might just be making the knife and selling it and uh, with no pretense, but it's, it's, it's made by a company that, uh, that boasts, uh, its lineage, which is a bunch of, a couple of old frogmen, you know, a couple of old Navy seals or, or from the days when they were called frogmen making watches and making knives. And I, I, I just assumed that was my problem. I assumed, uh, from what NAF Sergeant said and from the story behind the company that this was American made uh, by someone with dirty hands somewhere in North Carolina or something like that. Um, but it was made in China by someone with dirty hands and that's fine. Uh, it is an outstanding knife. I still adore it and love the feel of it. It really does have a super sturdy feel and, and it's, it feels dense, even though there's a lot of lightning pockets on the inside, you know, um, it's just an American designed knife made in China, but executed in such a way, made in such a way that it feels like a typical stoutly built hard use American knife on washers. So uh, and it uses CPM 20 CV and it looks like it was kind of like stamped in there. It, it 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 just they did a really good job of making it look not like a best tech. So here's to best tech and uh, and whoever designed this knife, whatever the, the old frogman is who designed this knife. I still love the design. Um, and it's, it, this does not reach, uh, the Jake Hoback level of 
deception in any way. Um, I, I think Jake Hoback was was <laughs> was very, uh, uh, you know, well, dishonest, I guess is the way to say it. Dishonest through omission. And uh, this they never said anything about its about its lineage and they never didn't you know they never uh whatever I, i'm just gonna leave it right there still love the mekong delta combat folder uh and starting to not care that it was made in china would i get another one the answer of course is no all right next up on the knife junkie podcast we're going to take a look at the knife life news uh gerber seems to be getting it right and they have a new one we're going to look at the state of the collection a couple of things that were sent here that i really dig and then we're going to talk about if you only have one fixed blade knife i know a lot of viewers and listeners of this show are much bigger into folders and i want to talk a little bit of fixed blade knives but before we go there i just want to say thank you so much to our patreon uh, patrons uh, it's really been helpful. We've been um, using that money to pay for the show, and uh, I'm going to be using it to pay for some upgrades. Um, I need to get a new microphone. <laughs> That's just the start. I need a new table because this happens. I, I need a whole bunch of stuff. And the um, funds that come in through Patreon really help uh, assuage uh, or uh, really help uh, uh, uh uh, with the costs. I don't know what word I was searching for there, but it was big and fancy. Uh, so thanks guys. I, I really, really appreciate it. And um, uh, I just want to bring you more and more of this great content. So if you want to help support the show, go to the knife junkie.com slash Patreon or zap this thing right here. QR code. Again, that's the knife junkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the knife junkie podcast. And now here's the knife junkie with the knife life news. So with the release of the Zilch uh, by Gerber that I sort of got just accidentally or, or, or impulsively, that's the word I'll use, uh, it seemed to me that Gerber uh, was starting to make good on their promise uh, of a new Gerber. And uh, what I mean by that is a few years previous, they came out with the, with the flat iron and a bunch of other knives that were... Um, much more in tune with especially the blade shapes, but with the designs that knife people like, not just big box uh, customers who need a knife. You know, they started to get a little bit more savvy with their designs. And then the Zilch came out, and though it was made of very inexpensive materials, showed tons of promise. I, I do really like the Zilch. Uh, great profile, great blade shape, great grind. Uh, great ergonomics. Everything about it was great. It was just cheap, cheaply made. So uh, I, I put a video out about that, and then they sent me the Sedulo to check out, and I really liked the Sedulo. Um, and um, and so I believe that they are back on the right track after many years of not being uh, so, and they're bringing out knives in better materials with much better designs. Okay, that is the background. So Gerber just came out with the savvy um now this knife uh from the knife news um article looks pretty damn good there are a lot of design cues and and that we see in the zilch the overall profile except uh here they've gone with a more warncliffe style bellied warncliffe style blade but the handle looks a whole lot whole lot like the um zilch and i loved the handle on the zilch it was very very comfortable um while being quite neutral uh you have you have the finger guard up front which i always appreciate appreciate personally and then you have a long straightaway uh that flares towards the back so just a great neutral handle excellent for all grip styles uh, even reverse grip i'm looking at that uh, great landing pad for your thumb there and in this uh, savvy, in the savvy, they have gone, they have upgraded the materials. Okay, so the red one we were looking at before is aluminum, and then here we see a marbled carbon fiber. Just beautiful. This is beautiful. Uh, nice looking clip, not deep carry, uh, but it does look like a nice looking folded clip. It's got a little bit of jimping on it for pulling the blade out. Uh, and then you've got a thumb stud. It looks like a thing, single th single sided thumb stud. And then you have an Axis style bar lock. Now, Axis style bar locks uh, have been very, very common since the patent ran out for Benchmade. And people, uh, people, different companies have been 
doing it great. I think it's a pretty um, relatively easy uh, and robust lock style to get dialed in. I think the biggest issue has always been the Omega Springs. I have never broken an Omega Spring, knock on wood, uh, but that's because probably I have tons of knives and rotate them in uh, so frequently that nothing gets too much use. This is exciting to me, uh, this Savvy. I really want to get my hands on it and check it out because if it's anything like the Zilch, just higher quality, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. I love the look of it. Uh, I do love aluminum knives, but uh, also that shred carbon fiber looks great. And I love what they did with the blade shape. The drop point on the Zilch is very, very nice. But to me, this this Warncliffe is a much more useful shape. And also, I just like the way it looks. And uh, you're asking, well, what is the blade steel? Well, the blade steel here is CPM 20 CV, which is awesome. I love 20 CV steel. It is the American version of M390, if you want to put it that way, or an American-made uh, M390 style recipe. That's why I just prefer it over M390. Uh, otherwise, I personally, actually, honestly, couldn't tell the difference. Um, they both are kind of a pain in the tuchus to sharpen, uh, from my perspective. So, uh, but both very robust steels. You're not going to have to sharpen that often. So, I'm really excited about this knife, the Savvy. I think it's a uh, good name. I think they're becoming more savvy with their designs and such, and I hope they continue that way. Um, this is this made in the U.S. I don't know. I hope this thing is made in the USA because uh, the Sedulo, which uh, was one that I I did a um, uh, a, a video on recently, was made in the USA and really really excellent. Uh, an excellent pivot lock is what they're calling it. Uh, their their take on the axis lock worked very very well. And yes, this is made in the USA. I'm looking at the uh, at the picture here, and you can actually read it. So, very excited about this model. I hope to uh, feature it here on the channel. All right, next up, this knife. Uh, we featured this on Thursday Night Knives, and it just puts a smile on my face. Uh, this is from. James Brand, the James Brand, and um, you know they're a company that I always talk about being the the hipster brand because they're a lifestyle company. They they are made up of designers or started by a designer who I believe came from Nike. So so their uh, idea of of does uh, product design and 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 what a product line is is a, a little bit different from just pure knife guy, um, and so it brings in different influences. I like to diss them because it's fun, but they do some really cool and interesting work. And, but this is the hippest knife ever to exist. Uh, this knife here, this, uh, little fixed blade knife here is made specifically for opening vinyl records. This is specifically for drawing across the opening of a, an LP record, you know that little opening on the side, and just to split the the uh, split the cellophane so that you can leave the cellophane on the record, but have a perfect slice down that uh, down that opening. Uh, it's a knife that you didn't know you needed, but if you are a hipster and you have, uh, or if you're old like myself and you still have a bunch of LP records, I got rid of mine a long time ago. But if you're an audiophile and you do have a record collection, this is the knife for you. It's called the Abbey. And I can only imagine that's after Abbey Road, the uh, greatest Beatle album, in my opinion. And I don't have a, much of a strong one on the subject, but I love that album. The Abbey is a is a, is the perfect little worn cliff for your record opening needs. Is this something we need? Uh, no. But I mean, do we need any of these uh, things? Do we need anything more than a buck one ten? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> so, a, a cool thing about this is that the handle is not made from G10 or micarta or what you might expect, but from recycled record vinyl, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, so it's all in keeping with the theme of the knife, and it's got that cool little fob on the end. Um, uh, any audio files out there, let me know down in the comments. Is this something you're going to buy? Um, if you're actually, if you're listening to this right now and you are an audio file and you like and you have a bunch of records, you have to get one of these and then you have to report back in and let me know how that little Warren cliff does at slicing the record. Now it's very small. So maybe that's the whole point. 
very, very small. You're not going to overshoot and, and risk scratching uh, the grooves of that record. Um, and, and then if you're one of many of the listeners or viewers here who don't even know what I'm talking about, a record is like an, an MP3 um, in the real world. It's like a tangible MP3 that you can pick up and break and you got to put it on a, a, another tangible machine that will play it so that you can hear uh, music sounds. All right. Uh, that is what we got for the state of the collection. I or not the state of the collection for Knife Life News. I'm I am excited about Gerber. I, I hope they they continue with this <clears throat> and start a, a robust U.S. Um, line of knives. Uh, I, I think they've already begun. I can't wait to check out the savvy. And James Brand, thank you for always, always supplying interesting color. Um, uh, and uh, interesting knives for all of us. Okay, st still to come on the Knife Chucky Podcast, State of the Collection, we're going to take a look at two uh, items sent to me by a company called Daily Carry Co., kind of pretty cool, impressive things. And then we're going to take a look at fixed blade knives. If you only get one, what should it be? All right, all that and more coming up on the Knife Junkie Podcast. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I received one of my favorite types of emails, um, and that's the type where an interesting company reaches out and says, we have an interesting product. Are you interested in checking it out? And um, oftentimes I say yes. And if it's not in my, I get a lot of stuff that's way not in my line at all. I'm not sure what people are thinking. Uh, and I'll say, no, thanks. You know, send it to someone else. But uh, in this case, this was a really cool one. Um, and da this company, Daily Carry Co., that's based in Utah, I think they design their stuff in Utah and then have their stuff manufactured overseas. Uh, they said, we have this thing called, let me get to the little package down here, called the tie pick. Do you want to check it out? It's a titanium toothpick. And I said, well, of course, <laughs> anything titanium. And so they sent this to me. It comes in a cool little box here. Pull it out. And this is the tie pick. Now, this is something that you can put on your keychain or you can throw a fob on it whatever because it is pretty small it'd be easy to lose if you didn't uh, put it on a keychain or something like that but all you do is unscrew this end to reveal a this is an airtight yeah, there's a little gasket there a little air airtight uh tube and then you screw this on this way it's very small so it's kind of hard to get there we go and then you have a little toothpick look at this thing it's tiny but it comes to a very acute point and uh it's really did i say it comes to a cute point or an acute point i mean an acute point but it is kind of cute i guess uh we were out at a barbecue the day i got this and i was like oh i should bring this and i just didn't i just uh, kind of left it on my desk and ran out the door cut to an hour later my daughter is complaining that she has corn on the cob wedged between her teeth and if only we had a toothpick uh, so yeah, this is going on my going back on my keychain. When I got home, I threw it on my keychain. For purposes here, I took it off. But just a cool little thing that you know you didn't know you needed until you needed it. Uh, say you don't have your Swiss Army knife on you. Well, you have this on your keys all the time. Um, I don't currently have a classic uh, Victorinox classic on my main keychains. I do my work keychain, but my uh, other one i don't so this this is going on there right next to the kershaw launch and uh i think it's very cool thank you daily carry co they sent me to uh the other one we we threw in the giveaway uh, on thursday night the other thing they threw in the package is way cooler i mean i, I really like the tie pick titanium nano toothpick but i like this a lot better uh they put in there a creation they call the mag blade and this is uh, designed by wh whomever designed the tie pick and manufactured somewhere uh, overseas. Um, so it is grade five or series five titanium and M390 blade steel. So it's got this super clean look. Look at this. Uh, when I got it, I hadn't really done my research and I was like, uh, what, how do we, how does it? And then I realized, opens like this it opens kind of like a butterfly knife just on a perpendicular axis to a to a traditional butter 
fly knife. So here we have the Kersh Kershaw Lucha, and you see the handles cover the edge and the spine. Well, on this knife, you have a similar rotation, except just on a perpendicular axis, and the, and the handles cover the left and the right side and encapsulate uh, the spine and the blade. So just like you can flip this knife, <laughs> I don't have a lot of room to do it, it's a big one, but just like you can flip this knife open, uh, this knife here, the mag blade, you can do the same thing. So what you do is you put it in your hand and you orient the little finger groove towards you, and then you just kind of break it apart, break the magnetic thing apart, and then you flip it like you would a butterfly knife. Now it takes a little getting used to because those handle scales are flat and not rounded, uh, relatively speaking, like you would have on a butterfly knife on a regular ballet song. But you can, if you kind of handle it loosely and you're not doing it under a camera, it's a really cool knife. I really love this thing. I, I got to say, um, I looked at the website once I got it and, and I determined being realistic that if this were just on paper and I, I hadn't have looked at it, I would probably pass on it. Like, you know, just if someone told me about the knife, I'd be like, eh, but man, I don't know who, who they had make this, but whoever made this did a beautiful job. And the knife itself is actually very comfortable in hand and useful. It's got this really great uh, American Tanto blade. And on the website, it says it's M390 blade steel. It's very well ground, very sharp. Uh, it does have the geometry more of a wedge. It's a, you know, behind the edge. Uh, it, it does um, it does come in at an oblique, more oblique angle, but it's super sharp. On the uh, tabletop, I did a close-up video of this and posted it on uh, this past Saturday. And I showed just cutting through paper, I can make, I can make continuous S curves with this. So it, it, it is wickedly sharp. It's just not uh, necessarily as slicey as uh, some knives are. That secondary tip, extremely useful. I also showed how you can use it percussively, um, but that's more of a tactical thing, a tactical fighting thing. When this, that's not this kind of a knife. But if you had to press it into that need, look at this. I mean, it's great in reverse grip. Edge in uh, is how I would probably use it or edge out, it's fine too. Uh, you've got a, a four-handed grip for me. I mean, a four, not handed, four-fingered grip, full four-fingered grip, and then you have a spot for your thumb. You could use this in a pinch. I always I always think of knives that way, even the most EDC of EDC knives. I just, it's just where my area of interest lies. And uh, so if you needed this as a tactical knife, it would be fine. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is keep it where I had it. So I, I dropped it in the front pocket of my backpack that has pens and there's a binder clip in there, which I should definitely remove. Uh, other pocket knives, string, all sorts of crap. So I threw it in there to bring it to work because I was going to fidget with it while I was editing. And uh, it acquired snail trails in the process. And I love snail trails on, on just plain titanium. So I'm going to put this back in there and let it be um, just a daily carry, but a daily bag carry. This could also work well in a pocket slip. Whoops, a leather pocket slip, uh, like you would carry a slip joint knife. Uh, but just a really unique and, and cool knife. I suspect it's made by one of the uh, better uh, OEMs. Uh, the cost of this knife is $200 or 199 bucks. Um, you're, you're asking, is it worth it, Bob? I'm going to say yes. If you consider other three inch, uh, OEM, uh, knives made of titanium and M390 worth it. This also has a bit of different kind of engineering here. So I think, uh, with the magnets and everything, oh, by the way, here are the magnets that hold it shut. On both sides. Uh, so maybe maybe a little pricey um, because and, and I, I'm only thinking that way because um, when I'm spending 200 bucks on a pocket knife, it's usually not a three inch pocket knife. It's usually bigger. And so in my mind, it makes that more worth it. But uh, if you think this is cool, if you think this is a cool design, I would go for it. It is a, an interesting company making interesting things. 
small and out of Utah. And um, this knife is really good. I just, I really like it. And it would be cool to see this with a few different blade shapes. Love to see this with a worn clip. Uh, I'm not sure how that would work. You know, take a little bit of redesigning of that handle, especially right here. Uh, but I'd love to see this with different blade shapes as well. So very cool thing. Very, two very cool things from Daily Carry Co. Uh, check them out, dailycarryco.com. All right. So that's it for the state of the collection. Uh, it's nice to have... Um, Sometimes it's feast or famine around here, and uh, it's nice to get new things coming in that uh, that I'm not expecting. This is actually something I forgot that was coming, and I didn't even know the knife was coming. And um, and then other times I have weeks where a bunch of knives that I may have purchased or uh, traded for or um, am receiving as loaners all come in at once, and I don't know what to show. There's so much. So it's it's funny, the the rhythms of how the knives come through here. All right, so the main topic of conversation today, I want to talk about fixed blade knives. And this is something that's been brewing in me for a while because frequently I will say when I'm doing a fixed blade knife close-up video or talking about a fixed blade knife on Thursday Night Knives, I'll frequently say, if, the, if you only get one fixed blade knife, because I'm aware that a lot of people are folder-only collectors, I'll say, if you only get one fixed blade knife, it should be this. And uh, I feel very strongly everyone should have a fixed blade knife, whether you're a collector of anything or not. Like what I'm saying is even if you're not a knife person at all, every household should have like a K bar or some fixed blade knife in it. And actually, that's the first one I'm going to recommend. But before we get to that, I want to show you uh, the knife that didn't quite make the list, um, but it has been my uh, one and only before I acquired a collection. This was the one fixed blade knife that I took with me everywhere I lived. You know, I lived upstate New York and then Philadelphia and then New York City and then Virginia. Every apartment, every house, every place I lived, every bed I slept in, this was the knife that was next to me. And this is the Master Tonto by uh, Cold Steel Knives, still in that old 1987 leather sheath that's about to just fall apart. A great, great fixed blade knife. Um, uh, those scratches on the bevel you see is uh, something I did to this knife after years of having it pristine. And I had used it for various things, camping mostly. Um, but I tried to make a Kydex sheath and scratched it up. Anyway, this knife has been with me through thick and thin. Um, that sounds corny. It's not like I was in uh, out in battle or anything with it. But uh, this has been with me the whole time. I This is not making the list because there's a different cold steel that I would recommend over this if you're only getting one. Uh, so I just wanted to show this off, the, the cold steel master Tonto. I've talked about this a million times. This is one that was made in Japan and um, just a great, great knife. The first expensive knife I ever bought uh, way back, way, way back in high school. Also, um, the handles on these cold steels that have, especially this one is pretty aged. Um, you start to feel the rubberized handle start to feel a little sticky. Like, I don't know, like maybe you don't want rubberized handles for too long. Like, you know what I mean? Start like, it feels like it's almost breaking down. What's not breaking down is the handle on this knife, which um, is probably the knife I would say you have to have if you're not a fixed blade knife person. Um, but, you want to get a fixed blade knife. And that is the USMC K-Bar or any version of the K-Bar. This one is a um, early 90s release that my brother got for me. Um, I think he got this for my graduation from college. So so uh, in any case, he got this for me way back in 3 or 94. And it is a, um, a K-Bar that they, they dusted off the design of the original K-Bar that was made for um, U.S. Marines in World War II. So they copied the sheath as it was then with the staples and the stitching, beautiful leather sheath. Um, and then they made the knife just like they made it back in those days. So here it is. Um, ah, such an excellent knife. Uh, so back when they did this re-release, they put a double edge on it like it was originally. This uh, swedge is very sharp here. 
comes to a very sharp edge, it, making this an excellent fighting knife. That Bowie shape, that hooking shape. I know a lot of people have used sharpened swedge knives like this and the Randall made uh, number one in this grip when they're fighting. So they'll th taking advantage of that curved clip. And it's a really nasty thing to come in contact with if you're slashing. You can still stab and thrust like this. Uh, but if you're swinging and slashing, instead of having the blade glancing away from what you're swinging at with that upward uh, belly, you're gouging in, tearing like a like more like a talon. So uh, I think they called that the Randall fighting method, uh, holding the blade like this. But in any case, uh, this particular model, like I said, is an old one, but but you can get all manner of K-Bar uh, these days. Uh, they make them with still with the um, with the leather stacked handle. They also make them with composite handles. You can get one in D2 blade steel, but uh, most of them are in that Crovan 1095 coated and with an unsharpened swedge. Unsharpened swedge is a little bit better for utility. Also, the swedge is a little straighter on the on the more modern K bars. Uh, but that sharpened, that unsharpened swedge allows you to put pressure on the back of the blade. Uh, it allows you to baton. It allows you to do a lot more uh, utility stuff than having that uh, super sharp back edge uh, for half of the blade does. So if you're only going to get one knife, get a K, uh, one fixed blade knife, get a K-bar for sure. And, you know, this is this is assuming you're not an outdoorsman, because if you were, you'd probably have fixed blade knives anyway. And uh, and you just want something around the house. This is great for utility. You could use this in the backyard uh, on you know your Sunday cleanup or whatever. Uh, but also great to have next to the bed um, for for whatever eventuality. So the the K bar, the USMC K bar. Uh, in this case, you can get the, the you can get the. Here, I'm going to keep these off screen. They're so big. Um, so USMC K-Bar or the Navy version or the Army version, whatever, just get a K-Bar. Uh, another knife that falls a lot in that category that you might want to get if you're if you are a hunter um, or looking to get into the hobby. Most people kind of grow up in the hobby, not the hobby, the activity, the lifestyle, I guess I'll say, of hunting. But I guess there's the rare bird who just sort of uh, starts late in life. I, I wouldn't mind starting at some point, um, just going out with other people who know how to hunt and learn how to do it and experience that. But this is the Buck 119, another super classic. I put this right after the uh, the K-Bar. I'll show it in the leather sheath first. I put this right after the K-Bar because it is a classic. Uh, it's one that a lot of people have um, passed down through their families, like the K-Bar. And uh, and it is uh, a very, very useful knife, both around the house and in the woods. All right, so here it is in its leather sheath. It has this sort of very signature um, giant, uh, what do you call it, retention strap. I love this. Uh, it is a little awkward when you draw the blade out, but here it is. Beautiful beautiful 1090 or what is this this is i'm sorry 420 um blade steel just a beautiful blade shape and so classic uh okay so you have a hollow ground blade so nice hollow ground blade and then a very sharp edge look at so hollow ground it does get pretty thin for how thick the blade steel is but look at how broad the sharpened edge is that just means it comes to a super acute edge it's very 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 sharp straight from the factory. This was a gift to me for my birthday oh, many years back. I think it was many years back. I think about four or five years ago, uh, a one of my wife's cousin's husband, who, who I, I know, but I don't know him that well. And uh, I like him. I've, I've always had great conversations with him during family get togethers. He shows up to my birthday party with this. And I was I was touched. What can I say? I was touched. I'm like, man, you're, I, I always liked you, but now you're really awesome. <laughs> uh, this is one of those knives that I used to look at, um, in the glass cabinet at, uh, well, we had a store back in Ohio when I was a kid called uncle bills. There were some other stores like, like you would see this knife in, in hardware stores and, and sporting goods stores. 
and I would lust after it. That clip point blade was just like, oh, so incredible to me. Um, but all of that aside, it is extremely useful. Uh, uh, you say 420 blade steel. Well, Buck does an amazing job with their 420. Uh, their, their 110, their 112s, all their standard models. Uh, you know, they do a lot of upgraded models these days, but all their standard models are in that 420. And it's awesome. And they've been using it forever. And by gum, you don't need 20 CV blade steel to cut something. Uh, the handle here is a, is a resin. I can't remember what it's called. Always thought it was kind of funny how fat the handle is, uh, but it's very comfortable. And I, I think, and this is pure speculation on my part, but I think they made that handle so fat because it's a an inexpensive resin and it's very smooth. So if your hands are covered with blood and viscera and you're opening up an animal um, and, and doing all your you, obviously I'm not a hunter as mentioned, but you're, you're dressing out an animal, you're, you're opening it up and, and it's, your hands are getting slimy and wet and you have this very slick handle here. Maybe having it really thick like that, as thick as the guard helps keep it in hand. Um, uh, you know, especially if you have big giant farmer hands and, and, uh, you know, you need something to hold on to. That's just speculation. What do you think? Let me know. Love the the classic uh, aluminum uh, butt cap and or, or pommel and and the asymmetric asymmetrical uh, guard here, so you can put your thumb comfortably on the back of the spine without having to negotiate a big tall guard. But down on the bottom, you have a, a nice large guard in case you're using this in another way. This could easily be used as a as a combat knife. Uh, I would imagine uh, I might want a little texture, put some tape on the handle, uh, but this thing could be used as a uh, in ways more than just fighting. So it's nice to have that guard there and to have that bird beak pommel. All right. So another great my only fixed blade knife is the Buck 119. They have, uh, as I started to mention, they have um, S35 VN and micarta versions that they've been uh, that they've had out for the past couple of years now, and uh, their buck is doing really cool stuff with their premium models. Uh, also, they have um, they've always had, and you can get a premium version of. I think it's the 120. It's a larger version of this knife. So let me put this back in the sheath and move on to the next. Now this is a much more modern knife, but really struck me when i got it and i mentioned it at the time when i did my reviews and i was showing off showing it off a lot on thursday night knives etc is the doug ritter rsk rsk stands for ritter survival knife mark three so this is basically uh the fix fixed bladed version of the mark one that we all know and love the hogue version of the grip till of the uh ritter grip tillion so this uses the same blade shape but before i get there uh Great nylon sheath, and that is not something you hear me say frequently, but a really great nylon sheath coming from Hogue. It's got a very, very sturdy, I mean, like, like I can't even compress it. Maybe if I squeeze really hard, it's got a very sturdy plastic lining that is ambidextrous, meaning you can drop the blade in either way, and it's fine, as opposed to this knife uh, in which the blade has to go in a very specific way. You can't put it in like that. Nothing more annoying to me than when you hand a fixed blade to someone, they pull it out and then they put it back in the sheath the wrong way. I'm like, dude, do you not have eyes? Can you not line up the, that very specific shape? But I don't say that. I just say, <laughs> I'll put it back. I'll put it back. Okay. Uh, so the Hogue here has an excellent, excellent nylon sheath. And then it's got these um, Molly compatible straps here they're also uh, very easy to put on it's a double strap system here so you can molly it or you can just put it right on your on your belt but you don't have to pull your belt off to put it on which i really appreciate you just unsnap it and it goes right on and these snaps are very stout and sturdy and then it comes with a, a nice length of paracord here and a little one of these things compression things but here's the knife a beautiful knife. Uh, it, it, it is. I have mixed feelings about the looks of this knife, I'll be honest, but it, it is beautiful in a, in a sort of way like the shark's foot uh, blade by Demco is beautiful. It is beautiful in its utility. 
And it's also beautiful in how it uh, harkens the RSK Mark I, the famous knife. Uh, but then you look at the utility of this, and that's where the true beauty in this comes out, because this is a tall blade of, uh, well, at, the, at its tallest part, an inch and a half. But the, of that flat grind is one inch, and so it's very, very keen and slender behind the edge, making, making a really, really nice slicer. Now, this is a survival knife. So what would you be using that slicing for? Uh, well, you'd be using it for handling vegetation of all sorts, also for making um, fire sticks, uh, you know, those, uh, what do you call it? feather sticks for fire making, for all manner of carving, for trap making, for anything you want. You know, people think of survival knives sometimes as being big, thick, thick robust blades. This has a decent uh, blade thickness, but really what you're getting is uh, a super slicing machine here in a very stout, it's not a machine, uh, tool in a in a very stout uh, build here. And that's uh, S45VN, which means it's a little bit tougher than F S35VN. And S35VN was a blade steel invented to solve a toughness issue with S30V. So this is 15 more tough than S30 in your S45VN. All that being said, I, I really uh, can't tell the difference um, with the way I use knives. However, I have taken this out in the backyard as my... Um, you know, as my uh, weekend outdoors knife, just when I'm farting around clearing vines and that kind of thing. And this thing is awesome for that. Uh, it it does lack size in that it's one, two, three, four. It's four and a half. Hang on. One, two, three, four and a half. Sorry, I get stage fright when I have to count on camera. It's got four and a half uh, inches of that S45 VN. So when it comes to using it, uh, like I mentioned, for vines, it's much better in this grip, in this reverse grip and pulling than it is on some of my larger knives where I would just use them as a um, chopping thing. With this, I would put a lanyard on and then choke way back to use it as a chopper, just due to its size. But this is a great overall one knife to have because you get <clears throat> a stout survival knife, but in a in a in a relatively svelte package, and you get a whole lot of slicing out of it, a whole lot of slicing in that tall, um, flat grind, <clears throat> tall, thin, flat grind. Another thing you're staring at right now is the handle. The handle is very, very evocative of the RSK Mark I pocket knife in that it has that those radiating uh, sunbeams coming from the pivot area, or in this case, that first grommet. And so you have lines radiating in all different directions. So it's very, very grippy, very grippy in the hand, but they've knocked down the texture enough so that it's not annoyingly grippy. So let me see if I can get the camera to focus on some of that texture there. There you go. So you can see texture in all directions, um, meaning if your thumb is pushing this way, you've got something to catch you. If it's pulling back that way, you have something to catch you. If it's going downward, you got a lot to catch you. If it's going upward, you have a lot to catch you. So just really great patterning on the handle here. You got a little exposed in the pommel for noggin knocking. All right, next up is the, let me put this back in the thing, is the Street Bowie. I'm going to show this in, well, oh, here, here we go. Here it is with the Spyderco. Here, here is the Spyderco Street Bowie. Uh, comes in this uh, nylon sheath that rattles a little bit. It's not very tight, but this is a great, great, uh, fully flat ground Bowie blade. And this reminds me of a small version, a much smaller version of the Cold Steel Vaquero Grande. Or not Vaquero Grande. What am I talking about? Of the... Um, uh, the, uh, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll, it'll come to me. This reminds me of the large, fully flat ground Bowie knife by Cold Steel that I love so much that I can't remember the name of. Um, not the Natchez, but the other one. So you get a lot of, um, performance out of this knife in terms of, this is a VG10 blade steel. This, it's a very useful utility blade with that full flat grind with the coating and with the VG10. VG10 is very, uh, corrosion resistant. And you can get a wicked edge on it, uh, but it's also pretty easy to sharpen. 
So you can use this thing pretty hard and bring it back to to true pretty pretty easily. Uh, keeping up with it with the strop and such. You've got a long run of jimping on the back for putting thumb putting your thumb on and powering, uh, making power cuts and slashes. And you've got a great, great point. So this is a, a Fred Perrin design and born out of a tactical use, a stashable Bowie blade that you can carry on the streets and use in self-defense, but would make an excellent one knife knife, one fixed blade knife, because it's just an extremely useful uh, clip point design and uh, executed really well. Got a rubberized handle for grip and uh, nice contouring there. Next, in the similar vein, is the SOG Seal Pup. Uh, the SOG Seal Pup is one that uh, seals actually legitimately use. I have read, and I'm like, man, you're a seal. You should use some other cool stuff. You know, there's some seals out there who have their own knife companies. Um, but uh, yet, yeah, and, and I'm sure those get used a lot. But this is a great knife because it's inexpensive, and, and you can beat the snot out of it as they so disgustingly say it comes in a nylon sheath that ha that is very good that has a big cargo pouch on it but i've swapped it out for this uh sog kydex a uh, great clip point again and uh, this one is os 8 blade steel <clears throat> you have nice uh, serrations there and very good grip also i think the thing's a looker I i've always loved the sog designs and uh, so this is my dedicated backpack knife. Carry this in my backpack all the time. If a fixed blade uh, need ever arises, this thing is wickedly sharp. Very, it takes a very nice edge, and and it's just really nicely done. Um, Sog, when this thing, when this one was made, Sog was paying much more attention to knives like this, and I think doing a much better job on knives like this than they were their folders at the time. Made in Taiwan, an excellent, excellent one blade knife. Do great in your backpack, do great in the woods, and will also do great next to your bed. Okay, next up is a big favorite of mine, a recent big favorite of mine. This is the Off Grid Knives Grizzly. Comes in a great Kydex sheath. The cool thing about this is that it is a camp and kitchen knife. You look at the shape of this big, fat, broad sax blade, and you can see how it can be used as both. It in a pinch grip like this. It is a great, great kitchen knife. You've got all of this knuckle clearance. Uh, the Aus 8 blade steel is great as a kitchen uh, knife. Uh, blade steel, it's pretty robust for the purpose, uh, but but you can bring it back. You can strop it back or steal it back to true pretty quickly. You've got a really nice broad blade. I mean, what is this? This is a two-inch broad blade. And so you, you, make your, uh, you make your cuts. You cut your uh, dice up your onion and then you scoop it all up on this nice big uh surface here and drop it in your pan that's one thing i love about uh broad kitchen blades i always wanted that uh, wustoff trident that was two inches thick for the same reason it's like a pal it's like a um what do they call it a cutting board blade and a it's like a uh, it's like a scoop and a knife all in one uh, but you also have a very robust handle here with the contoured and textured G10. You can get a full finger grip on it, and you've got the jimping. Um, this would be solid as an outdoors knife also. So great camp and kitchen knife. Uh, if you only need one and uh, and you do those kind of things like uh, travel, go anywhere where you might need a kitchen knife, but also might need a woods knife. This is the one. I love this knife. That's the off-grid knives grizzly. Next up, I would be remiss if I didn't represent tops, and I had uh, I looked at all my tops, and and they have dwindled uh, in number. But this is one that I have used and will never get rid of. I've used and used and used this one. This is the Tex Creek, and this is the original one. They make a large version of it uh, that I've never experienced, but. I haven't needed to. First of all, it's in this beautiful full grain. I mean, they make amazing leather sheaths. Uh, just a drop pouch sheath. And here is the blade. Classic drop point blade with a with a swedge. Nice big tops style jimping that feels great on your naked thumb or is grippy with um, gloves. Also, 
the palm jimping. Very important. People forget about the palm jimping, but it is very important. So you got that there and a very nicely contoured micarta handle scale scales here. How you got the Coke bottle from that aspect. You see the red liners and that quarter inch of uh, quarter inch thick slab of 1095. Very, very comfortable knife. Very, very useful to use. I think it's one, one, two, three. Yeah, it's four and a quarter inches long. And then they make a six inch version of this. The Tex Creek. Uh, just an outstanding knife and one of the few knives in my collection that actually shows real wear. This is one that's hard not to use if I'm going outside and banging around. Great knife. Okay, Tex Creek by Tops Knives. Now, if you're only going to get one knife and you want a super classic and you want to spend a lot of money and wait a long time to get it, or you, you, you go to Knife Center, some places that you can actually buy them uh, without waiting and ordering them, that would be a Randall knife, the, the classic Randall knife, any one of them. Uh, but there are a few that I think are more classic than others. There's the number one the, and there's the number 14. Those are my, my two favorites. They have a lot of others. They have the number two, which is the dagger, which I love. Uh, but if you're only going to get one, it's probably not going to be a dagger. It's going to be something a little bit more universally useful and so this is the number 16 SP number one fighter. I'll tell you what that means. This is the number 16 model. So it has the number 16 handle with the finger grooves and the longer sort of pommel here. It's a little bit longer than the 14. And uh, the SP number one, SP means special number one, uh, meaning this is a number 16 handle and chassis, but it has the number one blade. Uh, so the model number one is the most famous Randall knife. That's the Randall knife from the song Randall knife. That's the Randall knife that uh, GIs in World War II uh, carried. And um, so this takes that blade and puts it on the uh, 16 handle. And uh, this is something they've been doing for a, for a few years now. And uh, I just think it's amazing. It's it's 440 steel and you're like, oh, 440. But they've been doing it for so long. They they have it dialed in. They know what they're doing. This is a slightly hollow ground blade. And that swedge, as all Randalls are, is sharpened. All Randalls have a sharpened backside. Almost all. Even the ones that are more utility uh, minded. So. This is a classic. This is an heirloom thing. Not that all of these aren't heirloom. These will all outlive my, you know, flesh bag here. But uh, this is one that's kind of worthy of passing down. In other words, when it comes time, when I'm older and I decide I'm going to sell off a lot of my collection, this will be one that I don't. This will be one that I give to my daughters, you know, and hopefully they don't just turn around and sell it to buy a purse or something. But uh, yeah, this is heirloom, heirloom quality. And there are people out there who have their own heirloom Randalls from family members who served and got those. I think that's really cool. All right. So before uh, I showed the master Tonto and I said that that wasn't making the list because there's another cold steel that if you're only going to get one fixed blade knife, this is, this is uh, the cold steel. I, I think you should get, this is the SRK, the survival rescue knife from, um, from cold steel. This one is in SK five. It's about, I bought this one in nine, in 2006, 2006 uh, to put in a bug out bag that I made for my wife when she she had to move to London for a year. This is before we were married and I made her a bug out bag in case she had to escape London. And I'm sure this this knife is illegal in London a thousand times over, but send it over there anyway. Uh, just a, a, a classic at this point. Um, here, we'll start with the handle. It's got that Crayx sort of rubberized handle, a uh, Coke bottle uh, in cross section there, or I, uh, from the top. And then here uh, from the main aspect, very neutral handle, so you can hold it in any any grip and it's 100% comfortable. It's got that checkered uh, Craton uh, material there, nice big lanyard hole and a an excellent, excellently shaped clip point blade. That is just, um, universally useful for all tasks uh this would be great for batoning as it's got a sort of uh well it's got a, a saber grind flat saber grind there 
and a stout profile. You've got a swedge that comes to a near edge, but uh, you know if you wanted to sharpen that, it's set up for that. Uh, if not, uh, you could still baton with it. It might chew up your baton a bit because it is pretty acute there. And if you took it and whacked it against someone's forearm, you might get it to split. But uh, so you could go either way with that. Turn it into a fighting swedge, or or leave it as is and uh, and have a more uh, useful utility uh, thing. This is a six inch blade and just super super useful. It might not get your heart racing. It might look a little plain to you, um, but it does come in a number of different steels. SK five is kind of their most inexpensive. Uh, version and i think they have it in 3v now so uh yeah check this one out if you only want one fixed blade knife and uh, and you trust in cold steel which you should they're pretty awesome knives uh this srk is awesome all right penultimate knife in this list is my artac 2 this is an ontario knife and tool uh knife and and this has turned into the se hungless uh, but I'm going to show you my example. This is pretty big, barely fits. Uh, so this knife is standing in for all SE knives. Uh, this is an older one. Like I said, this is before they kind of turned into SE. But uh, this is the RTAC 2. The SE Hunglis is the one that's this size. And then they have uh, all of the different sizes going down. The SE 3, SE 5. Uh, and they're all really, really good knives and great for all around survival. Uh, you've got a full flat ground, nearly quarter inch blade and uh, 1095, which is tough and somewhat flexible. Uh, and I don't wanna say flexible, but is very, very tough. And then you have these micarta handles and it's big on this. This is the big handle. This makes me feel like a, like a little kid when I hold it actually, uh, but the SE5, the SE3, and the other knives are, are smaller than this and, and actually more realistic for that one knife knife. But I wanted to represent SE knives here. Um, so I, I showed you with this. Uh, here's a little incidental story. My brother has one of these. He has the Hunglis, uh, and he was using it uh, to chop wood. <laughs> and he chopped it into his calf. And I'm not laughing. Um, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But he, uh, that was on his birthday or his wife's birthday and he had to go to the hospital and, uh, he kind of ruined the day with an SE knife. Okay. Last up, last up is, uh, covering two bases here and that's a brand and it's a type. If you're a one fixed blade only person and you're not going to get the K bar, it's just not quite enough for you. I think what you need to do is just get a big Bowie knife. And in this case, uh, I would also say if you're only going to get just one knife and you want to spend a little money, you could get just a Bark River knife, whatever model. But here I'm showing you both a large Bowie and a Bark River. This is the V44 in a beautiful full grain, uh, grain leather sheath. It comes with a frog. So if you want to just slip this in the belt and have this little uh, leather, or, I mean, this little steel nubbin, hold it in the belt, you can do that or which is what I prefer, or you can keep it in this for belt carry. Beautiful, beautiful sheath. Also, when you buy them from Bark River, they either come like this or you can get them treated for water and they come darker and they'll treat it for you. Uh, but here is the blade, just a giant, gorgeous uh, Bowie knife, but not as big as some, uh, but uh, based on that Marine Raider Bowie style knife with that big uh, swelling blade there. And then this one has the Moran style handle. That's a, a fully sculpted horse hoof style handle. That's what I call it, horse hoof. Kind of looks like a horse hoof. And it feels so amazing in hand. And then if you use this thing to chop, uh, which is a great application for this knife, uh, you can choke back and use this flare to hold it in your hands. One of the USPs, uh, unique selling propositions of the Bark River knives is the fact that they do all of their edges um convex so they're uh, you know ever so slightly rounded um right before that edge makes it very robust very tough this is a two tool steel also a tough steel but it's a very a uh, tough type of edge for chopping and for all sorts of outdoor stuff 
So that's why I love Bark River Knives. They have beautiful, beautiful designs, beautiful fit and finish. And um, I, I just love those edges. The edges are easy to maintain and they are extremely robust. And for a large Bowie, you can't go wrong uh, with a Bark River uh, Bowie. They have a number of different Bowies. But if, if you're not in the market for a very expensive Bowie knife, Cold Steel makes some incredible ones. And uh, you can you can get a large Bowie from a number of different reputable companies, including Tops. Okay, I've gone long here. I can I can I can hear Jim's eyes rolling. Come on, Bob. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Jim is the best. All right, so here we go. Uh, I'm gonna jump out, um, but I want to make sure that you check out uh, this week's um, uh, coming up on Sunday the interview we do with uh, Brian Kim of Transparent Knives. He's a great guy, very smart. We had an awesome conversation, and he's got some very interesting things going on with Hinderer Knives that we talk about. And, um, man, it was great. I really enjoyed talking with him, and he's got a great perspective. So definitely check out that show. Also check out Thursday Night Knives tomorrow night, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And if you don't get all the way through this episode, well, I guess you have if you're hearing this, but you can always download uh, the episodes to uh, Thurs uh, to um, the podcast apps you see to the right of my face. All right, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, please don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.